Joel, let's start off with some weird observation to make things interesting. Speaking of the weird observations. All right, let me just get rid of this stuff. It makes video editing easier, so it doesn't look as bad. All right, so here's what we got, like 20 amps of current. Somebody's having a heart attack. That's how much current you have to pump into the heart. Why do we have to do that? The reason why we have to do it is because ample current is required to stop the heart. And then here's what happens. If duration matters, it's like about a thousandth of a second. You can stop the heart just for a thousandth of a second and then it, it resets itself. It's an electrical device. The heart is an electrical organ. It beats, it's got a rhythm obviously. And if it gets out of rhythm, what you need to do is just, you have to shock it to restart it. You have to shock it. You, you pump about an amp of current into the heart, stops it momentarily. And then when you let it go, it resets itself. Okay, so how much current is required to stop the heart? It takes about an amp of current. It represents amp or amperes of current. Except here's what happens. We pump about 20 amps of current into the chest cavity. Okay, so why 20 amps of current? That seems excessive. In reality, it's not, guys. Remember, the heart is located deep within the chest cavity. Okay, it's at the right stop. It's stopped. It's at, right, it's at the right place. This will protect that. All right, so um, you have to pump 20 amps of current for hoping that at least an amp of current is going to get to the heart and be able to stop it. Okay, so a lot of that current is going to go wasted. It's just going to dissipate all over the place. Duration is important. Uh, it has to be a very short duration, about a thousandth of a second. Why not make it one second or two seconds or whatever? Guys, the problem with that is if you pump that amount of current into the chest cavity, it's going to heat up real fast. If the duration matters, if you make it like half a second, tenth of a second or whatever, you can literally cook the heart. The 20 amps of current is the amount of current which is used in order to execute someone on the electric chair. Remember, it's the same amount of current. It's 20 amps, 20 amps of current. Somebody's having a heart attack, that's the amount of current you pump into the body, chest cavity. You want to execute someone, that's exactly the same amount of current that they administer in order to kill someone. All right, so 20 amps of current is large enough to kill someone. Except on the electric chair, obviously it's a continuous current and you administer it for up to a few seconds. It usually takes probably about half a second or less in order to actually find the heart. If you can pump about an amp of current into the heart. All right, so they, we got a problem. The problem is you're pumping 20 amps of current into the chest cavity while hoping that at least an amp of current is gonna get to the heart. Duration is important. You're not trying to kill the person. You're just trying to save this person's life. You're trying to stop a heart attack at that point. You're trying to reset somebody's heart. So it's it's mini lightning in essence. You're creating a lightning within the body. It's a controlled lightning. And what you need to be able to control is the duration. So how do you control the duration? How about the current? How do you generate this amount of current? How do you store the charge? All right, so this requires that you're gonna be able to store enough of a charge and be able to discharge it in a very controlled sort of fashion. How do we get to accomplish something like that? Believe it or not, we have some like this, we've been using it forever as a flash photography. Okay, so in more expensive cameras, such as this one, notice that they were trying to capture a bullet going through a banana. And so they have to activate the flash within three tenths of a million, millionth of a second, imagine that. So now you're controlling the discharge time. Here the discharge time is 2,000 of a second. All right, this is a precise discharge time. So how do you control the discharge time? Again, here the discharge time is gonna be three tenths of a millionth of a second. This is, this is unbelievable. Literally, you're creating a lightning and you're controlling the duration of it. That's what it means. All, right, all of a sudden, we're dealing with controlled lightning. The first thing you have to do is you have to be able to store up the charge that you're gonna use up. All right, so the original name is lightning jar. Okay, the interesting thing about it is, uh, notice that the inside is gonna be charged. So you got the negative charge on the inside. So the charge is building up. So this region is going to be negatively charged. Now, if you touch it from outside, what's happening is your through your body, positive charges will get pulled up to the outside until you have equal number of positive and negative charges. All right, so we were able to store charges within this region. Outside is getting positive charge, inside is getting negative charge. Now this turn, turns into a charge storage device. This is known as a capacitor. All right, so the original name was lightning drug. So can we store charges in a bottle? Lightning in a bottle? Absolutely. Inside is gonna be negatively charged in this case, outside is gonna be positively charged. You will have equal number of positive and negative charges and notice that there's a gap to space in between which is filled with this glass. All right, so glass is not a conductor, it's an insulator. So the charges are not able to jump through under the circumstances. So one side is gonna be negatively charged, the other side is positively charged. This becomes a charge storage device. It's able to hold charges. You can discharge it obviously, which means that you can equalize the charges by touching the top of this. Uh, so there's a ball on top, a metal ball. So if you complete the circuit by touching it, the charge will go through your body, completing the circuit, so there's gonna be a shock. So you will get yourself shocked. Boom, there's gonna be a zap, like that. So not only can you store charges using these devices, known as capacitors, you can also discharge them as well. All right, so you can just short circuit it or reduce the separation distance, make it small enough so that the charges can jump again. The spring break. Okay, so let's talk about the capacitors. 
These are chart storage devices. All right, and usually they're composed of two plates, known as a parallel plate capacitor. One plate is getting positive charge, the other plate is getting negatively charged. All right, so the amount of charge on one plate is gonna be equal to the amount of charge on the other plate. That charge is gonna be the same. One is getting positive charge, the other is getting negatively charged. So the question is, how do you charge it up? All right, guys, today we use batteries for that purpose. So you get a battery. Here's the negative terminal of the battery connected to the capacitor. So this is your capacitor symbol. Uh, so this plate is getting negatively charged. Positive terminal is gonna charge up this plate positively. All right, so this is gonna have a negative net charge. This is gonna have a ne positive net charge. Uh, so capacitor is gonna get charged up as soon as you throw the switch on. All right, so capacitors will have capacitance. All right, so capacitance is the ability to hold charge. So capacitor is a charge storage device. All right, so the way you store it up, you hook it up your battery. V represents the voltage or voltage or energy supplied by the battery, positive and negative terminals. All right, so the, the plate which is connected to positive terminal will become positive charge. The other one is gonna be negatively charged. All right, so it's gonna have a net positive and negative charge and the magnitude of these charges will be the same. All right, so how much charge you can store depends on the amount of energy supplied by the battery. So it depends on the voltage difference. All right, so battery is an energy storage device, whatever that means, it'll make sense eventually. It's a topic that we will cover next time after you guys come back. So uh, more energy stored, more energy that the battery supplies, the more charge that you can place on these plates. That's what it means. All right, so you got your proportionality sign. Okay, here's what we'll do. Um, I hate doing it. It's a mathematic, mathematician's approach to physics, which I don't really appreciate because I'm a physicist. I, physics as is without the math, it's still fascinating. So from a mathematician's perspective, hey, the amount of charge that you place or store depends on the voltage supplied by the battery, right? So you got this proportionality. So how do you turn a proportionality into an equation? You have to come up with a proportionality constant. So let's call that proportionality constant C, that's it. Uh, that's a mathematician's approach. I really abhor the books that use this approach. That shows absolutely no understanding of physics, no understanding of physics. All right, I don't refer to this as a proportionality constant. I refer to this as Capacitance, all right. I will say the amount of charge that you can store also depends on the capacitance of the capacitor. Capacitance tells you about the ability to hold charge, all right. So this, or store charge, or hold charge. All right, so this is the book definition. And I'll change the definition a little bit. I just wanna make it more common sense. So what I did, instead of using a book definition, I'm saying the amount of charge that you can store is gonna depend on the amount of energy supplied by the battery. And also gonna depend on the ability of a capacitor to hold or store charge, okay. And then I'm gonna turn it into an equation. That's what I'm gonna do, because I'm not a mathematician. I'm just gonna use, a normal common sense scale approach that we take in physics. And then I'm gonna say ability to hold charge. I'm just gonna say the amount of charge that it can hold. So the larger the capacitance is the more charge it's gonna be able to hold and that's what it means. So I'm just replacing book definitions by the meaning of what we are dealing with. All right, so capacitance is gonna tell you about the amount of charge that it can hold. All right, so larger the capacitance is more charge it's gonna be able to hold. The larger the voltage or potential or energy supplied by the battery is more charge that it's gonna be able to hold. Right? It's a charge holding device and that's what it does. All right, something about the capacitance is immediately you will notice that the amount of charge that it can hold is going to depend on geometry. Okay, so you've got two parallel plates. This is the most simplistic model that we can come up with. Now, the bigger the plates are, the larger the surface area is, the more charge it's going to be able to store in it. Right? That's common sense. All right, so larger the, the wider, the larger the surface area is, the more charge, simply because of it, it's going to be able to store more charge. So the area of the plates will matter. So now let's come up with our own proportionality constants. Let's play a mathematician a little bit. So you know that the capacitance, the ability to hold charge is going to be proportional to energy. Bigger the area is more charge I can place on. That's it. The other thing that you know, and you know it intuitively without justification, if you bring these plates near each other, you know what's going to happen, right? You're going to be able to store more charge in it. Uh, you know that uh, intuitively. All right, so reduce the distance, maybe make it shorter. So when you reduce the distance between two opposite charge regions, and immediately there's attraction. It's all of a sudden, boom, attraction is going to go on. All right, so what happens when you reduce the distance, now, once again, you're going to be able to store more charge in it. Okay, now, after having kind of bitched about it for a while, <laughs> I'm going to use the mathematician's technique of getting rid of these proportionalities, and then I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to turn this into an equation. And in order to turn it into an equation, this time I will introduce a real constant, and the constant that I'm going to introduce is going to be epsilon now. Okay, so the question is, what the hell? Now, that's an appropriate question given the circumstance. What the hell? Well, why use that constant? Okay, so that's one of the things that when you're reading a book, it's like, you know, everything makes sense. And then now we're turning into an equation. Okay, so we're using a mathematician's trick at this point. Previously, we didn't need it, but now we need it. And which means that we need a proportionality constant. But why use this constant? Why not use something else? All right. Okay, so that question is going to remain un unanswered for a while, if ever. 
All right, so we'll just turn it into an equation. Well, the conclusion of it is capacitance depends on geometry. Just remember that. Yes, it depends on geometry. What matters is this remains a question mark. What matters is the size of the area and the separation distance between the points. That's it. All right, so A represents area, D represents the separation distance between the plate, C represents capacitance. So the question is, what's the unit do we get to use for capacitance if that's the case? All right, so Q represents the net charge. It's going to be coulombs. V is the voltage. Well, voltage simply means that one region is positively charged, the other region is negatively charged, and there's a separation distance involved. All right, so this represents the amount of energy stored within the gap of two opposite charged regions. In this case, it's the capacitor. And C is going to represent the capacitance. Capacitance is going to be Q divided by V. So Q has the units of coulombs, V has the units of volts. So coulomb is a Frenchman. Volt is volta, that's Italian. So you take a Frenchman and divide it by Italian. So what do you end up getting? Believe it or not, guys, if you combine them together, you should get someone who's British. <laughs> Where do we get that logic from? I have no idea who comes up with these naming conventions. All right, so before we address that question, dividing a Frenchman by Italian, do we get someone who's British? Let's do a simple derivation for a parallel plate capacitor. Okay, um, this is the derivation that we will get to use when we get to the more advanced portion of it. All right, do I wanna do it? Yeah, let's do it anyway, in case we had a question. All right, so amount of charge stored depends on the capacitance of the voltage. We wanna come up with an expression for capacitance. Okay, so intuitively, I figured that it was related to geometry, but let's check to see if it's really the case. Okay, will the mathematics give us the same answer? So let's investigate. So I'll take this and sub for C. All right, so what I know, I know something about voltage, but when I see voltage, that implies um, a region of two opposite charges. One region is going to be positive charge, the other region is going to be negative charge, and there's going to be a separation distance involved. So as soon as I see that, that's the stuff that I'm able to picture in my head. And within this region, obviously, the electric field is going to be pointing from positive charge region towards the negative charge region. So this, this exemplifies the amount of energy stored within that region. So this is what I'm seeing in my head. All right, so that's it. That's the picture that I got. All right, so now this electric field is going to be caused by the amount of charge on these plates. All right, so let me do a back substitution and explain that. All right, so inside a capacitor, the charges will be distributed uniformly. And because of the fact that the charges will be distributed uniformly on these areas, these are, guys, this stuff is metal. Charges, when you place a net charge on it, charges will get repelled from each other as far away from each other as possible. So they're just going to keep moving until they're equally spaced. So which means that there's going to be a constant charge density. All right, so this is the equation that we came up with earlier using the Gauss's law. So this is the net charge divided by area. So this is going to give you a uniform density. All right, so what I could do is I'm just going to do a back substitution into that. The nice thing about this is all of a sudden now we started to get the geometry out of it. Okay, so area, the electric field is going to be inversely related to the area. So this is the expression that we got. We already have an expression for D. So the light charges will cancel. Denominator of a denominator is going to be a numerator. So you pull that up. Boom. Okay, so this is where you end up getting that constant from. Okay, so it's just the derivation. Okay, I was trying to come up with the same thing through just using conceptual physics. I came pretty close, except I didn't know. I was not able to explain why we were picking that constant. We were picking that constant because for whatever reason, Gauss decided to use that constant. Why did they pick that constant? I have no idea. That still remains a mystery. The only source that I have for these kind of things is usually Wikipedia. All right, so I'm a prisoner of Wikipedia for my research. I, I can probably find out exactly why he came up with that, except I have to find the original article and be able to read it. I don't read German, so we're stuck at that point. All right, so for whatever the reason, it goes back to Gauss. I'm not sure exactly why he picked that constant, but that constant is going to set a speed limit to how fast the electric field can travel in empty space. This is what happens that we will discover later on. Okay, so brief summary of what we've been discussing so far. So you got these two parallel plates, charge them up. Use a battery, that's all you have to do. One place is going to be positively charged, the other place is going to be negatively charged. You get H, you got L. H means high, L means low potential. High potential means this is positively charged. Low potential means it's going to be negatively charged. If there is a potential difference, which means that the region between these plates will be energized. Hence the reason why we're using that region as an electron gun inside the TV to generate an electron beam and then accelerate the beam through a hole in between. All right, so that's how we were using this concept before. All right, so capacitance represents the amount of charge that the device is going to be able to hold. All right, so the amount of charge is directly proportional to capacitance and also directly proportional to the voltage or potential supplied by the battery. The voltage and potential supplied by the battery is also going to be exactly the same as the potential and voltage difference between these two opposite charge regions. The energy supplied by the battery is going to be exactly the same amount of energy 
stored within these amounts. If you wonder why, it's called conservation of energy. The amount of energy supplied and the amount of energy stored will exactly be the same. That's what it means. All right, so the question of the proper unit for C. All right, so before we answer that question, one more time, this is like the fourth time we we're repeating it. The capacitance depends on the area, depends on the separation distance. The larger the area, the more charge you can store on this area. The closer the spacing between the opposite charge regions, the more charge you're gonna be able to store. All right, so it's within that region. All right, so capacitance is Q divided by V. Q is gonna be Coulomb, so V is gonna be volts. Coulomb is a Frenchman, volt is based on Volta. That's Italian, so Frenchman divided by Italian is gonna give you someone who's British and that person is Faraday. All right, so in honor of Faraday, capacitance is measured in terms of farads. All right, that's short for Faraday or we call it F. All right, so Faraday. <clears throat> farads is the proper unit that we end up using for that one. Something about Faraday, that's just about everything that we do in physics too. It's about Faraday. All right, everything that we will do in electricity is going to be related to this one. It's, what, it's the biggest thing. Physics one is all about Newton. The physics is all about Faraday. The difference between Newton and Faraday is Faraday could not do math. Okay, he did not have any formal schooling. They, if, if you have to take physics today, you will probably fail the uh, mathematical portion of it 100%. Because I couldn't handle math at all. So because of it, everything that he had done, he had done it visually. That's the reason why just about everything that we will do in physics too is visual. We got the electric field lines being generated by the positive charges that are directed towards the negative charges. Just about everything that we will do in electricity and magnetism came out of his head. And everything is visual because he cannot, this guy cannot do mathematics. And Friday is just about one of the biggest geniuses who ever lived. It happens to be the last physicist who succeeded in physics without using mathematics. Today, physics cannot be done without math, obviously. All right, so the, I know we had a huge discussion, so you got a cool on per volt is gonna be ferret, so D is the best answer for this one. And I like the When a battery is connected between two pieces of metal, it forces charge to flow from one to the other until the potential difference between them is equal to the voltage of the battery. That creates an electric field between them. If the voltage is doubled, so is the charge. So is the potential difference. And so is the electric field. In general, the charge transferred is proportional to the voltage applied, and the constant of proportionality, C, is called the capacitance. Okay, so you can only charge a capacitor up to the voltage supplied by the battery. Okay, I give the reason for that, because the amount of energy supplied by the battery and the amount of energy stored within the capacitor will have to be the same, called the conservation of energy. All right, so voltage supplied by the battery is gonna be exactly the same as the voltage across a capacitor, voltage across a capacitor. All right, so the energy is supplied by the battery, the amount of energy supplied by the battery is gonna be the same as the amount of energy stored inside the capacitor. All right, so the amount of energy supplied by the battery is gonna be exactly equal to the voltage difference between these plates. So, which means that this place is going to become positive charge and this place is going to become negative charge and the charges will keep building up until the voltage difference across the capacitor is exactly equal to the voltage supplied by the battery. What is that supposed to mean? Guys, what that means is uh, charging up a capacitor is going to take time. It's not instantaneous. Okay, so it takes time to charge up a capacitor and then it takes time to discharge the capacitor. It's how fast you want to charge, charge it up and how fast you want to discharge it is something that you can control as you will find out in the future lectures. All right, so you look it up to the battery and then gradually the charge will build up until the voltage and potential difference across these places is the same as the voltage supplied by the battery. Okay, so you can charge it up really fast or you can charge it up very slowly. You can also discharge it really fast and you can also discharge it very slowly. So there's a way to control that as you will find out. Capacitors look like this, all right? They look like kind of little toys or candy. All right, so all of them are the charge storage devices. Okay, so parallel plate capacitor, this bit of mapping mob that I'm gonna skip until the next lecture. Okay, so I'm just trying to build up the background stuff, your intuition at this point. All right, so capacitance, once again, the most common one is the parallel plate capacitor. And out of that, let's kind of just come up with the useful formula because this is the stuff that we will need to answer some of the multiple choice questions. All right, so it's a charge storage device. Larger the capacitance is, more charge you can store in it, and larger the voltage supplied by the battery is, the more charge you're gonna be able to store in it. 
All right, so you can keep storing charge inside the capacitor until the voltage difference between the places is the same as the voltage supplied by the battery. So the more energy supplied by the battery is, the more charge you're gonna be able to store in it. And the capacitance depends on geometry. All right, so the larger the area, more charge you can store. Smaller the separation distance, more charge you can store. All right, so the voltage represents the amount of energy stored within the gap between two opposite charge regions. This is the separation distance of the gap, and this is the strength of the electric field. Within the gap, the strength of the electric field depends on the amount of charge that you store within those regions. All right, so strength of the electric field depends on the amount of charge on these plates and that charge divide, the charge density of each and every single plate that you're looking at. All right, so these are the equations that we will get to use in order to answer the following questions. We have a bunch of questions, four equations. All right, so let's play this game. Okay, guys, I'm gonna give you like 15 seconds per question for answering them. All right, so put your answers in the chat. All right, so what do we have? Time's up. Okay, so we got two parallel plate capacitors and obviously they're identical in every, every single way, except one has a plate area is gonna be twice as large than the other one. Okay, so what do we know? If the area of the plate is twice as large, it's gonna be able to hold most charge, right? So it's gonna have a higher capacitance. So what do we know? Area goes up, the capacitance goes up. That's it. So if the area is twice as big, the capacitance is gonna be twice as large. And it's gonna have twice as more charge. That's the case A is the best answer. That was straightforward. All right, so again, you have 15 seconds. Just come up with an answer, put it in the chat. If you're correct, your yourself five points. All right, so what do we have? Again, we have a parallel plate capacitor. It's got a capacitance of C, so we got that. So double the area and then reduce the distance by one half. If you double the area, what happens? Capacitance is gonna go up. If you reduce the distance, what happens? It's gonna go up further. So I'm guessing that it's gonna go up by four times. All right, so increase the area by two times, capacitance is gonna go up by two, and reduce the distance by half, capacitance is gonna go up by two again, so which means that it's gonna be four times capacitance over there. All Okay, so this one is slightly different. So let's focus on this one. Number one, you charge up a capacitor, so it's gonna be fully charged, and then you remove it from the battery. All right, so once you remove it from the battery, the charge is gonna remain the same inside the capacitor. Okay, the net charge remains the same. It's called the conservation of charge, remember that? So you cannot put in more charge to that, and the charge is not gonna leak out of it. Okay, so what do we do? So now it's gonna net charge. It's gonna, it's gonna have a net constant charge. So, the, and then what you do is you immediately pull the plates apart. So the battery is disconnected. You increase the separation distance between the plates. What happens when you increase the separation distance between the plates? Remember, guys, capacitance depends on the geometry. So you increase the separation distance between the plates. What's going to happen is this capacitance is going to go down, but the net charge remains the same, right? All right, so what happens is the capacitance is going to go down. So what happens to the potential difference between the plates as they're being separated? So the capacitance goes down, all right? Net charge remains the same. All right, the area is going to remain the same. So what happens to the potential difference between these plates? All right. There are a couple of ways of com coming up with the right answer. So this one is actually kind of cute. All right, so the correct answer is the potential difference is gonna increase. And I, I can come to that conclusion without even looking at the formulas. It's just conceptual physics. The reason why I know that is because these two plates are attracted to each other, right? Through a conservative force field, electric standard force field. So you have to do work in order to separate these plates. So the amount of work that you do is gonna go into the potential energy of the capacitor in essence. Okay. All right, so I know the answer just using it, just, just reasoning through it, but let's come up with the same answer using formulas. Okay, so how do we do that? So we got these two plates and the amount of charge is in constant, so we cannot change that. So increase the separation distance. So that's gonna reduce the capacitance, charge is constant. So as the capacitance goes down, the voltage is gonna go up. All right, so that's one way of doing it. All right, another way of doing it is, like I said, these regions are attracted to each other. Okay, so these regions are attracted to each other. So you have to do work in order to separate. The other thing that you can take a look at is, look guys, the strength of the electric field within this region is gonna be constant, right? Boom, boom, boom. So it's gonna be a constant electric field. So what happens if you increase the separation distance? The voltage is gonna go up. 
uh, so which means that the energy becomes stored within that region. So there are three ways you can come up with it. My approach to physics tends to be very conceptual. The rest of it, the algebra of the map usually gives you the same answer. So it's going to increase. The voltage difference is going to, potential difference and voltage difference is going to increase. That's it. All right. Uh, voltage and potential difference is going to increase. Oh, that's the second argument that I'm trying to give. All right. So which means that you have to separate these two from each other. You have to do work in order to separate them because they're attracted to each other, right? The amount of work that you do is going to go into the voltage. Of, it's going to go into the potential energy of the system. This also represents the voltage difference. All right. This <clears throat> okay, now this is this time it's hooked down to a battery. So there's gonna be a constant voltage difference, but the voltage difference between the phases is gonna be the same as the voltage supplied by the battery, and now you're pulling them apart. Okay, so during this process, what happens to the amount of charge on the plates if that's the case? All right, so the voltage is gonna be the same. When you pull them apart, you're reducing the capacitance, right? All right, if you're reducing the capacitance, the amount of charge that it's gonna hold is gonna go down. All right, so let's take a look at it. So increasing separation distance, as soon as you do that, the capacitance is gonna go down. When the capacitance goes down, what happens? The voltage is the same, so the amount of charge that you can store in it is gonna go down. All right, so the best answer is the amount of charge is gonna decrease. All right, so how do we answer this one? Okay, so number one, it's still hooked down to a battery. So there's gonna be a constant voltage difference between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor. And so the amount of energy stored within that, within that region is gonna be the same as you are increasing the separation distance. So the question is, what happens to the strength of the electric field within that region? All right, so when you increase the separation distance, the capacitance goes down. Capacitance depends on geometry. All right, so capacitance is gonna go down. As the capacitance goes down, given the fact that the voltage is the same, the same amount of energy is supplied by the battery. So what happens? The net charge is gonna go down. The strength of the electric field is gonna go down. There's a couple of ways you can do this. Okay, so let's cover both of them. Number one, this is the voltage supplied by the battery. So this is gonna be constant. If you increase the separation distance, this is gonna reduce the electric field. All right, so that's one way of doing it. Not the only way of doing it. There's a second way of doing it. Let me check to see. All right, so you know that the voltage is going to be constant. If you increase the separation distance, the capacitance goes down. As the capacitance goes down, the amount of charge stored is going to go down. All right, so the, when the charge goes down, charge density is going to go down. The strength of the electric field is going to go down. Okay, so there are a couple of ways you can come up with the same answer. So those are the ways you can do that. So strength of the electric field in this process is going to increase. All right, this one is a straightforward question. So what do we have here? R increase in the separation distance between two charged parallel plates of a capacitor. So what happens? Increase the separation distance, it's going to reduce the capacitance. Right? We've already done that like 10 times already. All right, this one is, I'm going to give you 10 points if you can figure this out. <clears throat> okay, so what are we doing? We are weakening the electric field between the plates of a capacitor, right? So what happens to the capacitance of a capacitor? The reason why this is worth 10 points is because this one is tricky. Actually, it's not, I lied. This one is really straightforward. This is one of the easiest questions that you will miss, and you will miss this question repeatedly, the way your minds are conditioned to work until it becomes painful enough so that you stop missing this question. 
I gave you the answer like 10 times already. And now this is the first time you're noticing the answer that I've been giving you has a meaning. Meaning, capacitance only depends on geometry. It doesn't depend on the weather conditions. It does not depend on the voltage. It does not depend on the electric field. Only depends on the geometry. So what happens to capacitance? Nothing. Nothing is going to happen to capacitance. Okay. You reduce the strength of the electric field. It's going to reduce the voltage. It reduces the voltage. So you guys are thinking, oh, that means that the capacitance is going to go up. And which means that at that point, you're doing your algebra, your mathematics blindly. And I designed the course in such a way that if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't really get the concept, I just want to make sure that you get stuck somewhere. This course is designed in such a way that your math should be understanding driven. And immediately, you're going to start to get into trouble. The answer is capacitance only depends on geometry. It depends on geometry. I already said it 10 times. It depends on geometry. It doesn't depend on voltage. It doesn't depend on electric field. And this course, physics, what makes it so difficult is because it's understanding driven education. If you don't understand it, it's not like chemistry, it's not like biology. You get stuck, it turns into a really, really painful experience. But guess what, guys? The engineering is applied physics. All right, so um, I'm trying to make your lives easier. So I'm putting a lot of emphasis on understanding. So don't do this. All right, you're looking at the symbols and then you get an understanding for it. Oh, the strength of the electric field is going down, so which means that the voltage is going down. And then does this mean that the capacitance is going up? Does this mean that charge is constant? Okay, so it's boom, boom, boom. The only thing you need to know is it just depends on geometry. So it's not going to change. It's not going to change. It was a bit of a sarcastic remark there. And there's a reason for it because a lot of people miss that. Okay, so I know what happened. This thing just flickered, which means that we're probably on a different page. We're sleeping. Okay, so I'm getting better at this. Okay, um, moving forward, let's hide this. Okay, so getting back to the story. Remember the inside the TV tube, cathode ray TV tube. You got the electrons being accelerated within a capacitor into this hole. And so, and they were just exiting the pole. They were being shot out, basically, shot through this hole that you're looking at. So the question is, with what energy? Electrons were getting their energy from the field within, obviously, it's getting an electric field. And the electric field had energy stored in it, which is known as the voltage potential difference. So this region was energized, boom, boom, boom. And then if you place charges within that region, what happens to those charges also become energized. So that's known as potential energy. When the region is energized, that's known as voltage or potential difference. And when you have charges, they have potential energy. And if these charges are free to move, their potential energies will turn into kinetic energy because the force is a conserved force field in this case. All right, so, but how do we express the amount of energy stored inside a capacitor? So that's what we're gonna be focusing on. All right, so obviously the charges are energized and because they're energized, which means that they can jump through the gap, either unintentionally, like the Zenith story that I was telling you, so it would just fry the electronics, or you would do it intentionally, you have two leads and just touch them to each other. And then all of a sudden you're gonna end up getting a discharge. All right, so you can do it, control this, can control the discharge period, and you can also control the charge period either way. All right, how do you control the discharge as well as the charge period is something we will discuss in the future lecture. All right, at this point, I'm gonna take a shortcut instead of giving you a derivation. I'm gonna focus on a couple of things. Okay, so the energy of a capacitor, what does it mean? Okay, this stuff that we know up to this point, number one, here's a formula sheet, a uh, capacitor suction. All right, so obviously charge st stored inside a capacitor. The capacitance is going to depend on the geometry and then move to the side. Okay, so you got two formulas on the side. Capital U represents the potential energy of a capacitor. Okay, so capital U represents the potential energy of a capacitor. So this represents the amount of energy stored inside a capacitor. There are two formulas that you can use for that. Notice that both formulas will have capacitance. Okay, so both of them are going to be divided by two. Here, this deals with the voltage or potential supplied by the battery. And this is going to represent the amount of charge. All right, so don't have a derivation for this one, I'm not interested. But let's focus on the meaning of it and when to use it for now. All right, so energy stored in a capacitor, two formulas, we'll denote that. All right, speaking of these two formulas, the question is, when do we use these formulas? Okay, so let's just work on that one. All right, so let's just develop our intuition regarding the meaning of these formulas. All right, so how do we know which formula to use? That's where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. All right, so what do we have? Doubling the capacities of a capacitor holding a constant charge. So what happens to the energy stored in that capacitor? So what we'll do is we'll double the capacitance. 
then it's gonna have constant charge. All right, so charge is gonna remain constant and we're gonna change the geometry. So it's capacitance is gonna go up. So what happens to the energy stored in that capacitor and how do we do that? The whole idea of this is so that you guys know how to use these formulas. All right, so notice that you're doubling the capacitance while holding the charge constant. So you have to work with what's given you, that's, that's it. So there's a bit of information regarding capacitance and there's a bit of information regarding charge. So this is the equation that we will have to use. All right, so hold the charge constant, double the capacitance. So this goes up, capacitance goes up while you hold the charge constant. What happens, the amount of energy stored in it is gonna go down. All right, so you increase this, if you double this, uh, what happens, the amount of energy stored in it is gonna go down. So energy is gonna go down by half. All right, so the energy stored inside the capacitor is gonna go down by half. Energy stored inside the capacitance is gonna go down by half. All right, what is, what is the purpose of this? I don't see the purpose. This is the whole thing. All right, so what are we doing this time? We're doubling the voltage across a given capacitor. So the question is, what happens to the energy stored in that capacitor? Double this. The amount of energy stored in it is gonna go down, it's gonna go up, right? All right, so if you double this, two squared is gonna be four. So the amount of energy stored in the capacitor is gonna go up by four. All right, so it's gonna go up by four. So D is the best answer for that one. All right, so let's take a look at this case. So the capacitor becomes fully charged because it's connected to a battery. And then it gets disconnected. Once it gets disconnected, it's still gonna remain fully charged. And then what do you do? You increase the separation distance. All right, so there's no charge that's gonna be leaking off, which means that it's still got constant charge when you increase the separation distance. When you increase the separation distance, what happens? This capacitance is gonna go down, right? So what happens to the energy stored within this capacitor? All right, so what do we know? Okay, so this is, the section that we will have to use. So it's got next, it's gonna have net charge, constant charge. And then it's got capacitance. The capacitance is gonna depend on the geometry. So what's gonna happen is if you increase the separation distance, the capacitance is gonna go down. If the capacitance goes down, the amount of energy stored is also gonna go down. Okay. The, okay. Something didn't make a lot of sense. Okay, if capacitance goes down, the energy stored is gonna go up. Okay, I was being careless there. All right, so go up. All right, um, so this one is a different one. Hmm. All right, some of these things are a little bit out of place. All right, so let's go over. Okay, question number one, obviously I skipped that one. Capacitor is a charge storage device. What's capacitance? The capacitance represents the amount of charge or ability to hold charge or, ability, or amount of charge that you can store in a capacitor, right? Capacitance represents the ability to hold charge according to your book definition. From my definition, from my understanding is it's, it's the amount of charge that it can hold. How is it related to geometry? So it's going to be directly proportional to area. It's going to be inversely proportional to separation distance. Okay, when the capacitors are in parallel, okay, so we did not discuss that, so we'll have to, all right, now let's talk about how we come up with these equations. <clears throat> all right, so energy stored in a capacitor. So here's the capacitor. All right, so here's the capacitor. So I'm just going to charge it up to the potential supplied by the battery. So what you need to do is you have to start charging out, which means that you have to start moving positive charges in this direction. And you know, this is being positive charged. So it's gonna take work to bring up the charges. Right? So which means that you have to do work against the conservative force field in order to charge up these plates. That's the meaning of it. So the amount of work that you do in essence is gonna go into the potential energy of these charges. All right. So uh, this says the amount of work that you do is gonna go into the potential energy of these charges. So the potential is gonna be the potential supplied by the battery obviously, and then we're gonna charge this up until the potential difference between these plates is the same as the voltage supplied by the battery. And so this is the amount of charge that we're bringing up in that direction. Remember, the voltage supplied by the battery is gonna be constant. And then this is the maximum voltage difference that we can cause within the capacitor. So the capacitor is gonna be charged up to this voltage difference in essence. All right, so 
what is the amount of work that we need to do in order to charge up these capacitors? Uh, so this is the amount of work that you have to do, and which is the opposite of the work done by a conservative force. As a result, what happens, we have to we have to do work in order to bring these charges up. So which means that we're in essence storing energy in these charges. All right, so the voltage is gonna be constant. All right, so this is the amount of voltage supplied by the battery, so it's gonna be constant. All right, so it's a derivative. Obviously, one of the terms is going to change. So what you what you're going to be doing is it gets the constant voltage or whatever. We're going to try to bring these charges in. So the voltage is going to be constant, except we're just going to build up the charge. And that charge is being built up. The voltage could be expressed in terms of capacitance, right? So this is the charge that we're trying to put on the plate divided by capacitance. So we could do a back substitution right there. And the capacitance is going to be constant because it depends on the geometry. And then we're just kind of building up the charge on these plates inside a capacitor. All right, so we do the integral. So the integral for this one is going to be q prime squared divided by two. And then we will evaluate the integral at the limits. So we're charging up from a zero to a net charge of Q, your back substitution. And obviously, as you're charging up, the potential energy is going to be changing. So the potential energy is going to go from zero to the maximum potential energy that you can store inside the capacitor. So that becomes U. As a result, we came up with an expression that tells you about the amount of energy stored inside the capacitor. There's a second way you can express this equation. Obviously, you can express it in terms of the amount of charge stored inside the capacitor. Also, you can express it in terms of the voltage, the energy stored inside the capacitor. Guys, the voltage represents the amount of energy stored within the electric field of a capacitor, and this represents the amount of energy stored inside a capacitor. So you can express it in terms of either charge or voltage. So we're going to try to express this in terms of voltage. So obviously, this square the numerator. All right, so you got C squared, you got C. Then you get your cancellations, and you're done. All right, so that's how we come up with these equations. So what's the meaning of this equation? This equation represents the amount of energy stored inside a capacitor, right? So what would happen if you were to drop a charge within a capacitor? What's going to happen within a capacitor, this amount of energy is going to transfer to the charge. So if the charge is free to move, that amount of energy is going to turn into the kinetic energy of the charge. All right, so the hard defibrillators, I think this is the last thing that we did last time. Rhythm abnormality, just lower tween, the heart will be... It's the only way to test the device. When we were putting them in the defibrillator is when we when we induced this, this ventricular fibrillation, this very fast heart rhythm, you saw a lot of very rapid squiggles on the screen, and that was the heart beating very, very chaotically, with multiple short circuits whirling around the heart, resulting in the heart beating four or 500 beats a minute. So 10 joules is about 500 volts. Yeah, this shows the whole readout and how we induce it with shock. This is the BF. It takes, you can see, about eight seconds for the device to charge up, which is good another rhythm. The trick is to customize the implantable defibrillator so it delivers the lowest level of energy that can still get the heart beating back to its normal rhythm. There's more and more uh, enthusiasm about the, the, the benefits of electricity. I, I know for many, many years there was a lot of debate over was it better to treat patients with sudden cardiac death with medications or with defibrillators. And now uh, the studies are available showing that defibrillators are better than medications, at least the medications we have now. All right, so the defibrillators. All right, this is the example that we were looking at. So let's just go over this example one more time. Somebody's having a heart attack, so what do we do? We shock the heart. One of our is necessary to actually briefly stop the heart. The whole idea is to freeze the heart so it can reset itself. It's an electrical device. That's the way it usually works. It's like an electrical device. All right. So um, we use a capacitor. In this case, it's going to be a seven microfarad capacitor. And within the capacitor, the voltage difference, this is charged up to 5,000 volts. That's what it means. So that represents the amount of voltage difference between the plates. So the question is, what's the amount of energy that's usually pumped into the body cavity? And what is the power in terms of watts? All right, if this energy is administered within two milliseconds, so that's gonna be a thousandth of a second. So I've done the convergence, micro is 10 to minus six, it's a million. And the milli is gonna be 10 to minus three. These problems are straightforward. If you're not careful though, you could just get, in, get yourself into trouble. Um, so the energy represents the energy stored inside capacitor. So we got two formulas that we can pick from. The one that you pick is obviously related to what's given to you. So we'll pick that one. And then the rest is straightforward, plug the numbers in. And then we are gonna end up getting a number in terms of joules. And then, of course, you're not going to know what to do with it because when do you use joules for any purpose whatsoever? But uh, I'm going to give you some reference numbers for interpretation. So the power is the amount of energy transferred per time. So this is the amount of energy that you, the capacitor has that's going to be able to transfer or pump into the body cavity. And then this amount of energy is getting pumped into the body cavity or transferred to the body within this time period. So how fast the work is done. 
how fast energy is transferred, that's the minimum power. So the interpretation of the formulas where you guys kind of get into trouble. So this is the amount of energy that's going to be pumped into the body cavity. That's the minimum. And then we end up getting the number in terms of watts. Once again, you wouldn't know how to express this number because when you use watts in real life. Anyway, so now we have to do some conversions. All right, so we understand horsepower. We don't understand watts. So whatever the number that you come up with from physics, you have to express those numbers in the way you understand it. Horsepower is something that we understand. So which means that the amount of power delivered in terms of horsepower is going to be 600 horsepower. All right, so this number expressed in terms of joules, but still we have a problem with that. So we have to find a way to interpret this number. It helps to know what is required to stop the heart. Evidently, it requires about 200 joules of energy to stop the heart briefly. All right, so which means that a small portion of this energy that which is pumped into the body cavity is gonna go through the heart. That's what it means. So the amount of energy, the amount of power that goes through the heart in reality is gonna be about 140 horsepower of this is required to jumpstart the heart. All right, so now instead of talking about the amount of energy stored inside a capacitor, you know where the energy is stored, right? It's stored within the electric field. All right, it is stored within the region uh, between those two opposite charge regions, within the gap between two opposite charge regions. All right, so instead of talking about energy, we will discuss, we will talk about energy density. Okay, so I'm gonna grab a concept here that we will get to use in the future quite a bit. All right, so which means that we will have to come up with one more formula. All right, so this is the energy stored inside a capacitor. So I'm interested in the amount of energy stored within the electric field, within the volume of a capacitor that I'm interested in. All right, so within the gap between two opposite charge regions. So this is where the energy is stored. All right, so volume is the key. So the energy density is the amount of energy stored per volume that you're looking at. So energy is gonna be stored right here within the electric field. All right, so it's gonna be stored within this green region within the electric field. So the energy density is literally the amount of energy stored within the volume of this gap that you're looking at. All right, so that's what it means in English. So what do we know the capacitance? Now let's focus on this one. The capacitance is real, related to geometry. So I'm just gonna do a back substitution. All right. All right, and the voltage is gonna be, that represents the amount of energy stored within the electric field within a separation distance of D. All right, so I'm gonna do a back substitution one more time. Mm -hmm. All right, so, and all of a sudden I noticed that I'm trying to come up with an expression for volume. So what's the volume of this? The volume of this is gonna be area of each plate and the separation distance between those two. So area times D is gonna be the volume, right? So you got your area, you got your D. This is D squared, this is D. So obviously you have a nice little cancellation there. Guys, area times the separation distance is gonna be our volume. All right, so here's the area. And here's the gap separation distance. A times D is the volume that you're looking at. Okay, this is capital V, not to be confused with voltage here. So I'm just calling that this is the volume. So this is the, the amount of energy stored inside a capacitor. If you're interested in the energy density, you need to take this energy divided by the volume. So that's the energy per volume that we're interested in. So I'm gonna divide both sides by the volume and gives us the energy density. That's it, so that's the meaning of that formula. This formula is important because we will get to use this formula. All right, so this tells you about the energy stored within the volume. This represents the amount of energy stored within the electric field. Amount of energy stored in, in the electric field within the volume between two opposite charged regions. All right, so that's, I'm not gonna do any math problems regarding that, but that stuff is gonna become important in the future. We will get you to that formula in the future. All right. Let's talk about dielectric. Dielectric is any material that you can place into the gap of a capacitor. Right. And the sort of stuff that you will place within is usually a uh, insulator. It could be paper, it could be wood, it could be water, it could be um, it could be glass. All right. So you don't put conducting materials and put insulators within that space. And what happens to these insulators? Usually, they become polarized. All right. So any sort of insulator that you can place within a capacitor is gonna be a dielectric that's or dielectric materials and what happens to it in essence it becomes polarized. And why is that important? It's important because when it becomes polarized, what happens to the strength of the electric field? The strength of the original electric field is going to diminish as a result. So you place a dielectric material within inside the capacitor, as soon as you do that, you actually reduce the strength of the electric field within. There's a test question for you. Why is it that placing a dielectric inside a capacitor will reduce the electric field strength within the, the capacitor? The answer is, well, this is something that we discussed before. So what happens? Notice that the dielectric is going to become polarized. When it becomes polarized, notice that this side of the capacitor is going to negatively charge, that side is going to positive charge, right? So what happens within the capacitor? Well, there's going to be an induced electric field uh, opposing the original electric field, right? Induced electric field is pointing in the opposite direction of the original electric field, the initial electric field. Electric field is a field, it's a vector field. Directions matter. If everything is pointing in the same direction, the strength goes up. If some, portions of it is pointing in the opposite direction, the strength is gonna go down. 
So the induced electric field is going to be opposing the original electric field, thus reducing its strength. All right. So because it's called vector addition. So what happened as soon as you place a the electric within the gap of a capacitor, you were able to reduce the strength of the electric field. So that's that's what happened. All right, now let's express this from a mathematical perspective. So the electric reduces the strength of the electric field. So the original electric field strength is gonna go down by K. All right, so here's the original electric field. The strength of it is gonna go down by K. K is known as the dielectric constant. All right, so it depends on the material that you're placing in. For glass, it's gonna be different. For paper, it's gonna be different. For plastic, it's gonna be different. So it completely depends on the strength. Depends on the type of dielectric material that you're placing in. The only thing you need to know at this point is the strength of the electric field is going to go down by this much. And how much it's going to go down is going to be given to you by the dielectric constant. So this represents the strength of the original electric field, if there's nothing inside the gap. And so this represents the strength of the electric field with the dielectric within a capacitor. All right, so strength of the electric field is going to go down. All right, strength of the electric field times the separation distance represents the voltage and potential difference between the plates. So what do you think is gonna to happen to the voltage difference? What's gonna happen to the voltage of a capacitor? If the strength of the electric field goes down, the voltage is also gonna go down by the same amount. All right, so now we got two conclusions. Conclusion number one, if you're using that dielectric material, the strength of the electric field is gonna diminish. Also, the voltage difference between the plates will diminish. So the voltage is also gonna go down. All right, we're not done yet. We got one more. And now what else happens? Potentially can happen. All right. So imagine that this is the amount of charge that you can store inside a capacitor. So assume that that's going to be constant. What that means is at this point, uh, the voltage is you now the amount of charge is going to be constant. So which means that you remove this from a battery. Okay, so the, the battery is not going to be attached at this point. So it's got a net charge and the amount of charge that it holds is going to be constant. So it's completely removed from the battery. This is a charge storage device or whatever the charge that's got on it, it's going to remain there. All right, so that's the meaning of it. All right, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a uh, dielectric into, inside, inside a capacitor. As soon as you place a dielectric material, what's gonna happen? It's gonna reduce this voltage. All right, so the voltage times the capacitance, it still has to give you this exact same net charge. So which means that as soon as you place a the dielectric material, the voltage goes down, the capacitance is gonna go up. All of a sudden we come up with a conclusion, which means that the dielectric is gonna increase the capacitance of a capacitor. All right, so every time you place a dielectric, this is gonna allow you to be able to increase the the capacitance of that capacitor by K. So the K is the dielectric constant. All right, we're not done yet. So what happens to the charge if it's hooked onto a battery? All right, so the voltage is gonna be constant because it's not hooked onto a battery. All right, so it's got capacitance. It's, it's got a certain amount of charge on it already. So this is the original capacitance and this is the original charge. So what happens if I put a dielectric inside a capacitor. So as soon as you place a dielectric inside a capacitor, what's going to happen is this capacitor is going to go up. As a result, the amount of charge that you can hold is going to go up. All right, so this is the last conclusion. So which means that if you're using a dielectric, the capacitance is going to go up, the net charge is going to go up. So which means that you can store more charge inside a capacitor that has got a dielectric inside of it. All right, so four conclusions out of this. Strength of the electric field is going to go down. The question is why. That's the test question. The voltage is going to go down. The voltage difference is going to go down. All right, once again, the question is why. That's also a test question. I explained those. And then um, capacitance is going to go up. As a result, it's going to be able to store more charge. So the question is, why did the capac capacitance go up? That's a test question. You have to kind of investigate that. All right, that's an important test question. You can't just say it comes out of the derivation. I don't play that nonsense game. You have to really justify it. You have to justify it based upon the geometry, this and that. So you may have to do a little bit of an investigation on your own because those are test questions. All right, so the net charge is gonna increase by K because the capacitance is gonna go up by K. So the question is, why would the capacitance go up? And remember, capacitance is related to geometry. So try to come up with a reasonable explanation for it by the time you take it. All right, so what do we have? We got a dielectric material, such as paper. This plate we can place on a capacitor. It's gonna hold a fixed charge, which means that it's not connected to a battery. So what happens to the electric field between the plates? Well, what's gonna happen to the electric field? The strength of the electric field is gonna diminish, so it's gonna become weaker. So the best answer is B. All
All right, so this time we place the dielectric material once again inside a capacitor, whatever the capacitance. So capacitance is really related to geometry. So capacitance is going to go up, right? So the question is fine. That's something you will have to investigate yourself. All right, so we got the capacitor. It's being charged up to the same voltage of potential difference. All right, so this is the voltage difference between the plates. And as soon as you place a dielectric material, so what happens to the voltage is going to go down, right? So the voltage difference becomes small. So, all right, once again, this is a capacitor. All right, so you charge it up. So here's the original charge. So as soon as you place a dielectric material, what happens is capacitance is going to go up as a result. It's going to be able to hold more charge. So let's see. All right, so capacitors in parallel, or as well as the capacitors in connections. All right, so in this case, we got three capacitors, and all of them are connected to each other in parallel, and everything is going to be connected to a battery, a one common battery that we got. All right, so the battery is going to energize every single capacitor. So the voltage difference across each and every single capacitor is going to be the same as the voltage supplied by the battery. All right, so the voltage difference is going to be the same as the voltage supplied by the battery. All right, so that's one of the crucial things that we need to focus on. All right, so the voltage supply and the voltage difference across each and every single capacitor is going to be the same. So which means that the amount of charge that each and every single capacitor is going to be able to hold is going to depend on the capacitor. All right, right now it sounds like blah, 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 but it's going to make sense shortly. All right, but one thing that you need to notice is this is the equation that we will get to use. All right, so this is going to represent the net capacitance all now because of the conservation of charge. Yeah. The voltage difference across each and every single capacitor is gonna be the same as the voltage supplied by the battery. So this is the charge. This represents the charge stored within the first battery. Second, this represents the charge stored within the first capacitor, second capacitor, and then the third capacitor. Notice that the voltage across each and every single capacitor is gonna be the same. So V1, V2, and V3 all are gonna be equal to each other. So which means that V could be factored out of the equation. And all of a sudden this is gonna look like the main equation. So this represents net charge. This is going to represent the net capacitance, and this is the amount of voltage supplied by the battery, uh, which means that the net capacitance, the total capacitance can be found by summing up all the capacitance values of capacitors connected in parallel. All right, so the two things, three things that you need to know about this conceptually. Number one, the voltage across each and every single capacitor, if they're connected in parallel, it's going to be the same as the battery. So the voltage supply and voltage stored Voltage supplied by the battery and the voltage stored by the capacitors will be the same. The next thing that you need to know is the amount of charge is going to depend on it's going to depend on the capacitance if that's the case. The larger the capacitance of a capacitor, the more charge you're going to be able to store in it. Okay. And lastly, total capacitance can be found by just summing up all the capacitance values in essence. All right, so that's it. All right, so Capacitors are connected in parallel. And then one of the things that you need to remember is the voltage across each and every single capacitor is going to be the same as the voltage supplied by the battery. All right, so what do we know? There, I think there are two correct answers for, for this one. So we've got two capacitors. Uh, one of them has a larger capacitance than the other one and they're connected in parallel. All right, so notice that the voltage difference is gonna be the same across each and every single capacitor. All right, so which means that D is the correct answer, but that's not the only correct answer. Also, the one with a bigger capacitance is gonna be able to store more charge in it. So, which means that A has to be a correct answer as well. So in this case, A and D will be the correct answers. All right, so now we're dealing with a case where the capacitors would, will be connected in series. <clears throat> Okay, so one of the things that I want you to notice when they're connected in series is the fact that this is hooked onto this battery. This is going to be negatively charged. Okay, the entire series is hooked onto th this terminal as well as that terminal. This is a negative terminal. Negative terminal is going to charge up this plate negatively, and positive terminal will charge up that plate positively. All right, so if this gets charged up, so is this one. Everything else in between will become polarized. All right, so everything else in between is going to become polarized. So this is going to charge this up negatively. And in between, the net charge is going to be neutral. So which means that the, within this region, the positive charges will get pulled in this direction. The negative charges will get repelled in that direction. Within this region, the positive charges get pulled in this direction and negative charges get repelled in the opposite direction. All right, so that's what happens within that region. Okay, so okay, let's just get out of here. All right, so we got, 
because of the fact that this gets charged up and that gets charged up, okay, whatever the charge here is gonna be the same as that charge and everything else becomes polarized, regardless of the capacitance values, each and every single capacitor is gonna hold the same amount of charge. So the amount of charge held by each and every single capacitor just depends on the amount of charge which is supplied by the battery. That's it. All right, so what's gonna happen is the amount of voltage drop or the amount of voltage across each and every single capacitor is gonna vary. All right, it depends on the capacitance, capacitance value of a capacitor under the circumstances. So the voltage supplied by the battery is gonna get split among these capacitors. And when you sum up the voltage stock stored within these capacitors and compare it to the voltage supplied by the battery, all right, they will have to equal to each other. Can you go get her? They will have to equal to each other. All right, this comes about because of the conservation of all right, so this happens because of the conservation of energy principle. All right, so we got to have the capacitance values of each and every single capacitor because they're connected in series. The amount of charge that they will hold is gonna be the same. Okay, the only thing that happens is the voltage, voltage supply, voltage across each and every single capacitor is simply going to change. All right, so here's the voltage supplied by the battery. All right, and each and every single capacitor is gonna have the same net charge. So the amount of voltage, the amount of energy stored in, in each and every single capacitor is gonna depend on the capacitance value of the capacitors that we're looking at. All right, so how do we compute the total capacitance of a circuit if the capacitors are connected in series? How do we do that? All right, so once again, we end up using the main equation and then the net charge is gonna be constant, obviously, and the voltage is gonna be supplied by the battery and the amount of voltage across each and every single capacitor is gonna depend on the capacitance value. All right. We also know that the charge is going to be constant, but the, the voltage stored energy stored within each and every single capacitor is going to depend on it's going to depend on the uh, capacitance of each and every single capacitor. So this is the total voltage supplied, and this is the total amount of energy stored within these capacitors connected in series. All right. So these all of them are going to have different values. So the voltage can be expressed in terms of the net charge per capacitance. So this comes out of conservation of energy. Mm -hmm. All right, so then we have to express the voltage in terms of net charge divided by capacitance. So the net charge stored within the first capacitor divided by the capacitance of the first one, likewise the second one, likewise the third one. And you know, all of them will have the same amount of charge stored. So Q1 is going to be the same as Q2, Q2 is going to be the same as Q3. And so all of them will be Q, so we can factor out Q. And, and now this expression looks exactly like this expression. So this is the amount of voltage supplied by the battery. This is the net charge coming out of a battery. So this expression that you're looking at, the reciprocal summation of all the capacitance values is gonna be the reciprocal of the total capacitance. All right, so the capacitance values will be summed up reciprocally in order to get the total reciprocal capacitance. So that's the equation that we will get to use whenever the capacitors are connected in series. All right, once again, the details, you don't have to be able to do the derivation, but understand the fact that the voltage is going to get split across capacitors. The voltage is going to represent the amount of energy stored within each and every single capacitor. Every single capacitor is going to have the same current value. And that's it. And then know how to compute the total capacitance of a circuit that has capac capacitors connected in series. All right, so what do we know? The only thing we know based on everything we discussed is the, they will all have the same charge if they're connected in series, that's it. They will all have the same charge. So that's how we come up with. Okay. If you have a circuit that has combination, combination stuff, capacitors in parallel as well as in series, how do you do that? Well, notice that both these are gonna be parallel to each other. So if they're parallel, so you need to find the total capacitance of these by adding them up reciprocally. So it's gonna give you a reciprocal total. So I would add up the parallel ones first. So this is gonna give you a reciprocal total. I know what you do, you know the reciprocal total, now you got the total capacitance between these two. So this is gonna be in series with this one. Now you just add up the capacitance values and you're done. So now that sort of stuff is straightforward. All right, I'm um, not gonna do it numerically because there's not, not much to gain from it at this point. All right, so let's do a quick review of the stuff that we covered. So when the capacitors are connected in series, series, so explain the, explain the potential across each and every single capacitor is in any way different from the voltage supplied by the battery. Um, yeah, all right, so the potential difference across each and every single capacitor depends on the capacitance of a capacitor under the circumstances. All right, so the potential difference is gonna be 
related to the capacitance of the capacitor. All right, so explain where and how the energy is stored in that capacitor. It's going to be stored within the gap between two opposite charged regions. And it's going to be stored inside the electric field within that region. So what's a dielectric? A dielectric is any sort of insulator that you can place inside a capacitor. And what happens to it, it becomes polarized. So anything that you can polarize is known as a dielectric. So it needs to be an insulator. So what happens to the electric field magnitude within a capacitor in the presence of a dielectric? The electric field is going to diminish. Its strength is going to go down. What happens to the voltage? Once again, the voltage is going to go down. So what happens to the charge? It's going to be able to hold more charge because its capacitance is going to go up. All right, so the capacitance of a capacitor, it depends on geometry and speaking of capacitors, they come in all sorts of shapes. All right, I'm looking around, I don't see a parallel plate capacitor. Well, this one is a parallel plate capacitor. All right, this is the one which is a capacitor, parallel plate capacitor. The rest of them are, they got, this could be, a, I think these are also parallel plate capacitors. This one is a cylindrical capacitor. You can also have a spherical capacitors. All right, so the capacitance is going to depend on geometry. Also, it's going to depend on shape, obviously. So, what is the capacitance of a cylindrical capacitor? All right, so how do we do that? All right, notice that the inside cylinder is positive charge. The outside is going to be negative charge. All right, now that now we're doing some a little bit more advanced physics at this point. So let's do a derivation so you guys know how to do this sort of stuff. All right, so cylindrical capacitor. All right, so inside region, in this case, is going to be positively charged, the outside is going to be negatively charged. So there's going to be an electric field from positive charged region towards the negatively charged region. And what else? Uh, A is going to represent the radius of the inside cylinder. The B is going to represent the radius of the outside cylinder. And because I'm going to end up using it in the near future, I'm also place, I'm going to place my Gaussian within this region. All right, I will use the Gaussian in order to figure out the strength of the electric field. All right, there's a reason why I've spent a week talking about Gaussians, um, because we will get to use that concept. All right, so what do we know? So the amount of charge that could be stored inside a capacitor is going to be given by this formula. So what I'm interested in is I'm going to come up with a mathematical expression for the capacitance of a cylindrical capacitor, in essence. So geometry is going to matter. So what I'm going to do is just isolate C on the left-hand side, and then figure out the voltage and potential. Voltage and potential represents the amount of energy stored between two opposite charged regions. Now we design our parallel plates. So which means that we have to do a little bit of work. So what does voltage mean? Voltage means, voltage represents the amount of energy stored within the electric field between the gap between two opposite charged regions. All right, so which could be expressed like this. This is gonna represent the voltage and potential difference. So it's, this is the strength of the electric field. Within this gap, the R is gonna represent the radial gap, all right, within this direction. And then we will express that gap between the limits of A and B, all right? So you're looking at the distance between this surface and that surface, in essence, so it's going to give us the voltage and potential difference. All right, so this is a concept from last week. Okay, do we know the strength of the electric field? Hell no. Is there a formula? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I don't care. What you need to do is you have to actually come up with an expression for the electric field. How do you come up with an expression for the electric field? Well, you know, it's a nice looking geometry. Why not use the Gauss's law? All right, so that's exactly what we'll, we'll do. So we will use the Gauss's law within that region. All right, so uh, now I'm noticing in blue, you should, you should have come up with R. R is going to take us to the Gauss's surface. Anyway, so what is the, so this is going to represent the amount of electric field intercepted by the area of the, the Gauss, Gaussian surface that we're looking at. So the Gaussian surface is going to be spherical just like that. All right, so the area of the surface is going to be 2 pi. Don't forget the R and times, this is going to be L. All right, so it's going to give you the circumference of this times L is going to give you the area of the side of, side of a uh, cylinder that you're looking at. So that's the area which is going to be intercepting the electric field in essence. All right, so isolate the electric field from there. All right, now we came up with this expression, thanks to Gauss. And then just substitute back into that formula so we can get the voltage and potential difference between the opposite charge regions. All right, now there's an integral here which needs to be evaluated between A and B. And then when you do the integral, that sort of integral is going to give you the natural log of R, which is going to be evaluated between A and B. All right, so I'm just going to simplify this. So we'll do a back substitution there. Now we got our voltage term. Looks kind of neat. And now we have to do a back substitution into the main equation, which is this. Grab that, just place it there. Oh, well, this was fun. And notice that the Q is going to cancel out, that charge cancels out. Okay, the only thing left is the geometry at this point. All right, so we got a denominator of a denominator. So I'll pull this up to the numerator. 
and we came up with an expression for the capacitors, what cylindrical capacitor, that's it. All right, so that's how it is done. This is the radius of the inner, inner uh, cylinder. This is the radius of the outer cylinder. This is the length or the height of the cylinder. All right, it's perfectly, it's perfectly well done. So, you know, the earth is negatively charged, right? Mm. Slightly negatively charged. Which means that the earth acts like a charged storage device, which means that the earth is a capacitor. That's what it means. We live on a capacitor in essence. Okay, so the question is, what is the capacitance of the earth? If we are thinking, treating it as if it's a capacitor. The only thing we know is the average radius of the earth and that's it. All right, so how would you do a problem like this? The problem with this problem is we know that the earth is gonna be negatively charged. If it's a capacitor, the capacitors will have two regions. One of them is gonna be negatively charged, the other is positively charged. So where would you put the positive charge region if you're treating Earth as a capacitor? Which region would be positively charged? All right. And all of a sudden that becomes a problem because that's not explained here. We know that the Earth is negatively charged, so it, it is a capacitor, it's a charged storage device. But how do you express this capacitance and with respect to what? You have to express it with respect to a second sphere somewhere. So where would you place the second sphere? All right, this is more of an excuse to do a derivation in reality. If somebody gives you a problem like that, they're not interested in you finding the right formula from a different book and then plug numbers into it. That's not the way we do stuff in real life. This is not high school. What you need to do is you literally have to solve this problem. You have to do a derivation. Derivation is a way of solving the problem. All right, so that's exactly what we will do. We'll just set it up. All right, so let's come up with an expression for a capacitance for a spherical capacitor. In our case, the inside sphere is gonna be positive charge, the outside sphere is gonna be negatively charged. And then we'll just, once again, we will repeat the same process that we did for the cylindrical charge. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab the same geometry in essence. Now imagine that you got the inner sphere, you got the outer sphere, and there's gonna be an R in this direction, the invisible R in blue, is gonna locate the Gaussian surface one. All right, just, just like before, let me isolate C first. All right, so the voltage is gonna represent the electric field. It represents the amount of energy stored in the electric field between the opposite charge regions, separated through a distance of R in this case. So one region is the inside region, the outside region is gonna be the negatively charged region. All right, so it's, it's the strength of the electric field, which is going to be stored within this radial distance between two opposite charge regions that we're looking at. All right, so you're looking at the gap between this surface, which has a radius of R, which is, has a radius of A, and the second surface, inner surface, which has a radius of B. All right, so once again, you don't know what expression we will get to use for the electric field. All right, so the best thing to do is use the Gauss's law to figure it out. So that's what we will do. So if we are gonna be looking at the flux, that's gonna, that's gonna be the amount of electric field intercepted by the Gaussian surface. This Gaussian surface that you're looking at is the area of a sphere. All right, so it's gonna be four pi r squared. All right, so we got four pi r squared times E equals to Q divided by epsilon naught, so for E. And then we came up with this expression. So this four pi epsilon naught, I don't know why I decided that I'm just gonna Expressing in terms of the strength of the electric field. Now it looks like this from a distance this is gonna act like a point charge in essence. All right, now let's take a look at the potential difference between these uh, spherical surfaces. We have back substitution. All right, so we got an integral between A and B. All right, so when you're done with the integral, this is what you come up with. So you have to evaluate it at the limits. All right, so distribute the negative sign into the parentheses. We have back substitution. All right, so it gives you the voltage difference between the spheres. All right, so plug it back into the main equation right there. All right, so Qs will cancel. All right, um, I'm just gonna simplify this one. So I'm just gonna let him have a common denominator. So it's gonna be B minus A divided by A times B. And everything is in the denominator because I want my mathematical expression, the formula to look like these generic formulas. What I'm gonna do is uh, number one, this is a denominator of a denominator, so I'm just gonna pull it up. Number two, I got my constant in the denominator, which is fine normally, but because I wanna have a formula that looks like the formulas from any other book, this time I'm gonna take my electrostatic force constant expression in terms of epsilon naught. Okay, so which means that I didn't have to really convert this to K in reality, I don't know why I did that. All right, so, now, here's what we're interested in. So if you're trying to solve, if you're trying to come up with an expression 
for the capacitance of Earth, you need to have a second surface. Earth is getting negatively charged, so there has to be some region where th there's a sphere which is positively charged. Okay, guys, there's no such region around the Earth, obviously. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna come up with an imaginary sphere at a distance of infinity. We will place it right at infinity. So there's gonna be a second sphere looking at infinity. That's what it means. All right, so, which means that we will have to evaluate this expression in terms of the second sphere being at infinity. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, factor this out all right, by dividing A by B. And then I'm gonna evaluate this at the limit that B goes to infinity. All right, so B is gonna go to infinity. All right, notice that B's will cancel here. Any number divided by infinity is gonna be zero. So that expression is gonna to go to zero. And here's my final expression. All right, so this is gonna give us the capacitance of Earth. A is the radius of the Earth. The rest of them are constants. So you just plug the numbers in and then you're done.